future of the International Space Station with Homer Hickam. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. This week, we're going to look at the future of the International Space Station as we explore this orbiting outpost for humanity. Hello, everyone. Uh, on the on Saturday, the second of April, the day after we recorded this this episode, uh, Demetra Gozin, the head of Roscosmos, announced uh, that Ro that the Russian space agency will suspend all operation and cooperation aboard the ISS with international uh, partners including NASA, the European Space Agency, and the Canadian Space Agency. Uh, NASA Chief Bill Nelson responded calling for continued international cooperation aboard the ISS, as well as in the future exploration of space. So, with that in mind, on with the episode. We're going to talk with Homer Hickam, the self-made rocket designer who helped lead negotiations with the Russian government over their role on the ISS. We're going to talk about his work as the space station took shape and look at how the war in Ukraine might affect the orbiting outpost. The International Space Station, the most complex machine ever created by the human race, has orbited our planet since 1998, at least the first couple of components. Since that time, humanity's home away from home has hosted travelers from several nations, hence the I in ISS. The space station is composed of five of, of large modules, and five of these are managed by the Russian government. The progress resupply ships provided by Roscosmos also provide an essential periodic boost to the ISS, lifting it up, keeping atmospheric drag from bringing the space station to a fiery death. No! Now, both the United States and the Soviet Union launched and operated space stations in the 70s and 80s. The crown jewel for the American space program was Skylab, which lifted off on the 14th of May, 1973, just a few days before television coverage began showing the Senate investigation of the Watergate scandal. And much like the Watergate break-in, Skylab encountered problems right from the start. During liftoff and deployment, one of the main solar panels was damaged, together with a shield designed to protect the vehicle from micrometeorites. <laughs> Occupied by a total of just nine people uh, over a mere nine months, Skylab came crashing back to Earth on the 11th of July, 1979. Mir was the first modular space station constructed in orbit by Roscosmos between 1986 and 96. Experiments conducted aboard Mir include research into astronomy, physics, human biology, and more. This outpost in orbit uh, re-entered the atmosphere on 23rd of March 2001, following more than 88,000 orbits of Earth. No! On the 20th of November, 1998, the first segment of the International Space Station, the Russian-built Zargia control module, lifted into orbit above the Earth. It was joined two weeks later by the first U.S. design component, the Unity Node 1. This technological behemoth was slowly constructed piece by piece, over 30 missions taking place over a decade. 12 additional missions built up the ISS since that time. The first crew arrived on uh, 2nd of November 2000 and humans have occupied the vehicle ever since. The European Space Agency became part of the action in 2008, adding their Columbus Laboratory to the station and Japan arrived soon after. Today, the ISS is as large as a six bedroom house, four times larger than Mir and five times larger than Skylab. The ISS is the largest peacetime project 
ever developed by the human race. The ISS National Laboratory is home to hundreds of experiments in orbit from government agencies, universities, and other organizations around the globe. The war in Ukraine has led to calls from Moscow to cut back on essential services provided for the ISS by the Russian Space Agency. The sanctions could even include ending the availability of progress ships to boost the ISS, potentially dooming the orbiting space station. No! Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. We talk with Homer Hickam about the possible future of the International Space Station in light of the current war in Ukraine. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we're delighted to uh, have Homer Hickam back on the show. Among a litany of interesting things, uh, he's a self-made rocket scientist, the author of Rocket Boys, and he was the subject of the movie October Skies. And in 1994 and 95, he went to Russia to help negotiate uh, operating conditions aboard the International Space Station. Welcome back to the show, Homer. Well, thank you, James, for having me. It's great to be back. Yeah, so everything you've done, just give us a little bit of background. How did you come to be a part of these negotiations with the Russians as the ISS was kicking off? Well, um, I mean, Let's go back a little bit about what I was negotiating on. And, of course, that was the International Space Station. Um, we had, um, back in the 1960s and early 1970s, of course, we had the Apollo program where we went to the moon. And um, after Apollo 17, it was decided, a couple of things were decided during the Apollo missions. One of them was, all right, we've gone to the moon. We've got our footprints and our flags so we're done with the moon. And uh, it was, looking back on it, a horrible decision. Uh, we could have kept going to the moon, maybe not as often, um, taking a little time to assimilate what we had learned and so forth. And now we would not have to recreate it as we are doing right now or trying to with Artemis. So it was a very fateful and foolish decision to stop Apollo going to the moon. And, but there was a lot of hardware uh, left over. And so what are we going to do with this? And so they came up with the Apollo applications program. And this is long, I was uh, a Vietnam veteran. So in the late 1960s, I was in Vietnam. And in the 1970s, I was mostly working as a department of army civilian, had nothing to do with the space business, but I was very interested in what was going on. So I did pay attention. Uh, so with this Apollo applications program, uh, one of the things they decided to cobble together with all this hardware was something called Skylab. And Skylab was a space station. Meanwhile, on the other side of the Earth, the Russians had not been able to go to the moon. They're in one uh, uh, rocket program, which was equivalent to the Saturn V, had blown up spectacularly a couple of times. They had given that up and decided just to use the rockets they had uh, to create little mini space stations. And that would be their thing. And um, that they and they just basically said, oh, we don't care about the moon. We, re we never really cared about the moon. So they lied through their teeth on that, but we didn't know that much about the N1 program at that time. So anyway, we decided to have Skylab 
which was uh, taking the S4B stage, the last stage in the Saturn V, hollowing it out and putting in a lot of um, a lot of hardware in there where astronauts could stay 30, 60, 90 days. Uh, and we would learn a little bit about um, living in low Earth orbit, uh, homesteading space, as it was called. And so we did. So we launched uh, Skylab. Meanwhile, there was another program that had been approved during the Nixon administration, and that was the shuttle program. And the shuttle program, there were a lot of ideas behind it, but the whole idea was that, oh, well, the Saturn V costs so much money. Um, we want to uh, come up now with a way of getting satellites into orbit or all kinds of hardware into orbit, uh, but we're going to do that with a, a rocket system. And basically, we're going to bring the whole thing back and uh, refurbish it a little bit and shoot it off again. So they were talking about uh, this shuttle thing. People had a lot of ideas on what that was going to be like um, that uh, would be launching like once a week. It would be incredible. It would be so cheap uh, to use. But um, so Congress approved it. President Nixon signed it. But then they started um, – pulling funds away from it constantly. And so the designers of the space shuttle uh, kept also pulling things away from it. Okay, so most of it we're actually not going to bring back. That's, we'll, put the, we'll put the big tank with all the propellant in it um, uh, onto its side and we'll just burn that up. And uh, okay, so it's way too expensive to put in necessary chemical rocket systems that we knew a lot about. Let's get these cheap solid rocket motors and attach them to the side real cheap. And yeah, we'll uh, bring them back. That's it. We'll refurbish them and so on. So uh, while NASA was starving for funds, they did the last little bit of Apollo with Skylab, and then uh, there was the um, Apollo Soyuz, where a Russian spacecraft and an American spacecraft met up in orbit, and that was it. It was done. We abandoned Skylab. It was still up there. It was a wonderful space station, had all kinds of capability. We just essentially, we just abandoned it. And we went on for quite a few years um, uh, five, six years without having any capability of putting humans into orbit until finally uh, the first space shuttle was launched. And that was in 1981. That's when I came on. Um, I, I was 38 years old. I started working for NASA. And I uh, my first job was to be involved with the design of something called the Space Lab which was a laboratory that went back into the cargo bay of the space shuttle, which uh, didn't take us too long, though, of um, flying shuttle to realize this thing is a really expensive beast to keep going and refurbishing. But it didn't matter by then. We had spread all the manufacturing out all over the country. So we were just about, Congress just kept uh, funding uh, the shuttle. But Space Lab was our way of at least getting a, something like a space station back into orbit. It was actually designed by NASA, but it was built by the European Space Agency. We desperately needed their money. So it was built mostly in Germany and Italy. And um, it, uh, became, it was originally called a sortie lab. That is, it, it went up with the space shuttle for a week, no more than two. All the experiments inside of it were changed out. They were in racks. They were brought back and, and uh, all changed out again. And this was great, as a matter of fact. It was terrific. Um, it was uh, uh, the capability suddenly uh, that we kind of backed into. Nobody really thought about this. They were just trying to get bags of money. But all of a sudden had the capability with the space shuttle of putting a laboratory in space that could be brought back changed out, all the experiments changed out, and, and sometimes reflown in case they didn't work. And this was tremendous, bringing in the international uh, partners, mostly the Europeans and then the Japanese. And I worked th then with the Japanese. I went over to Japan, trained the first Japanese astronauts to work on the space lab, and that was terrific. But before I finished up with Space Lab J, as it was called, we had the Challenger accident which also changed everything. So before the Challenger, it was um, required by regulation that all American satellites be put into orbit by the space shuttle. This gave the space shuttle something to do. 
And even it didn't matter how expensive it was. And this is why the European Space Agency got going big time with their Ariane uh, launchers. And also the Russians started to come up with some commercial capability because we had put all our eggs into the space shuttle, which was tremendously expensive. Uh, so the Challenger came along. That uh, made uh, uh, Congress and NASA and everybody else see, well, we just can't depend on the shuttle anymore. So we're going to go with expendable. So that started the whole new expendable uh, uh, launching programs. And that created a number of, of, uh, of, of expendable launchers, which led right up to SpaceX, although they're not expendable now, but that, that all that seed money occurred because ultimately because of Challenger. Really, so so we had the space lab, but we had a lot of capability with the space shuttle, and all of a sudden, not much use for it. And then we also had something that President Reagan had created called Space Station Freedom, and Freedom was just limping along. And I worked on that a little bit after Space Station or uh, Space Lab J. It was just limping along, being starved for funds. I don't know that it would ever have been built, um, but. Um, when the Clinton administration got in, Al Gore looked out across uh, the space environment and decided, you know what, we ought to bring the Russians in. They've got a lot of experience with um, space stations. And also, by the way, it looks like North Korea, Iran, some other bad actors out there want to hire these Russian engineers. So that's what happened. So all of a sudden, uh, we got the, these uh, MOUs created between us and the Russians that um, or we needed to create them uh, to figure out how we could really merge our two programs together. And also, the, uh, not only did that um, use up the Russian engineers, give them something to do, it also gave our space shuttle something to do. It was the perfect vehicle, as it turned out, to build a space station. So how did I get involved with it? Long story, a long story made long. Uh, is that after Space Lab J flew, I worked on the Hubble Space Telescope repair mission, which flew in uh, 92. And uh, then I had uh, so much experience with working with the internationals, with the Japanese, that I was assigned to go to Moscow uh, with the team to negotiate with the Russians on how we were going to merge our two human spaceflight programs, and specifically my job, was to help us all figure out how we were going to train astronauts and cosmonauts. And there could not have possibly been two different approaches to training as what we had. So that was the chore in front of me was to get the Russians and the American side to agree on how we were going to train the crews for the uh, what became the International Space, Space Station. Right up, I'm pretty excited. Love your stories, Homer. Uh, <laughs> so, where do we stand now? In what ways is the International Space Station dependent upon Russian input, components, personnel, et cetera? Well, <clears throat> until um, very recently, we were extremely dependent upon the Russian program. We had no way of getting. American astronauts or European astronauts or any astronauts uh, up to the space station except uh, through the Russian Space Agency and their Soyuz. Uh, so um, that's, we, we really depended on them for that. We also uh, have depended on them over all these years and we started, we started building the thing in 98. So it's really became, I'd, I'd say around 2004, five, is when it really became enough of a station that um, it started to drag uh, even at 200 miles uh, in, in elevation and altitude. There's an, still enough air molecules up there as big as this beast is, it drags against that very tenuous atmosphere up there and gradually starts to lower it's until, and you can't let it do that because eventually it will break up in the thicker part of the atmosphere. So the Russians have done two things um, that uh, have been essential, and that is to bring the crews up um, and also to boost the, um, the International Space Station up. 
uh, enough to get it higher uh, and uh, so that it will take longer to degrade its uh, in its orbit. It does that through mostly through its progress uh, cargo supply vehicles, which attach itself to the Russian segment. And, um, and then before it detaches, it uses the propellant that it's got inside of it to boost uh, the station back up. Then it detaches and burns up in the atmosphere. Um, there's also some um, data management systems that uh, are snake out of the Russian side into the American and European and Japanese side, uh, but it's not particularly necessary to have it. We could uh, reproduce that pretty easily. So now we have the Dragon and um, uh, by SpaceX. So we have a means of delivering crews into orbit. We still don't have any uh, dedicated systems, to, however, to boost the station to a, to a higher orbit. Um, that would be something, if we lost the Russians, we'd have to develop fairly quickly. And I believe Elon's even talked about um, possibly developing systems that could do that. Is that realistic? How could, could SpaceX you know, push, develop a system to boost the ISS in time? Well, I never bet against SpaceX on anything. <laughs> if they say they can do it, typically they, they figure out how to do it. However, the, the Dragon is not really set up for that or, uh, right now. It, um, the only system that it's got um, really once it's in orbit and is attached to the space, space station um, is whatever is left over from its escape uh, rockets. It has some escape rockets that are built into its side. Those are not... Uh, capable safely to be used to raise the orbit of the ISS. Uh, so something would have to be attached to a dragon that's different now in order to make it work and uh, it'd be expensive and um, and would take it take quite a bit of work to do. Uh, the Starliner, however, Boeing's um, entry into human uh, space flight. Um, that one, of course, as we know, the first time it went up, there were all kinds of problems with it um, in terms of what orbit it was able to get into, was not able to get up to the space station. Uh, and then sitting on the pad, it had a lot of, of unexpected corrosion in some of its valves. That, um, so it's been kind of a mess. Uh, but Boeing thinks they've got the Starliner fixed now. Uh, so, and we look for it to fly in May. So if it does fly, it will go up to the space station. And if I don't think they would dare use it to, to boost the, the station, but uh, when it's declared operational, it's actually designed uh, in such a way that it could be, it's very much like the Soyuz or the Progress where the rocket engine is just in the back of it, and and it would it could easily be used to um, to raise the station. And we also have the Cygnus, which um, is up there right now, and there is going to be a test. And the Cygnus is a cargo craft, um, and uh, it is launched out of Wallops Island. Um, actually, uses a, um, a Ukrainian slash Russian uh, uh, set of engines. <laughs> uh, uh, however, so they're going to be replaced by American built engines soon. So the Cygnus has a capability also of doing it. So it really kind of you know depends on on how much of a crunch we get into it. The Russians toward the end of the of April, I think. Um, they have indicated uh, that maybe they are so angry about everything, they're just going to pull away from us. But we've got plenty of time between now and then to figure out contingencies. And also, the station's in high enough orbit right now that it could probably go for three, four, maybe more months without worrying about it reentering. So we've got a little while to, uh, to work on that. And so what would be worst case scenario? What, what is the worst that the Russians could or would, would likely, likely do? Well, worst case would be sabotage, of course. Um, you know, just, uh, 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 you know, their cosmonauts get into the Soyuz and leave the hatch open. <laughs> That's the worst case uh, right there. And, uh, of course, we'd have cap we don't have quick capability, actually, for internal uh, repressurization repre because uh, we've got all these cables. If you look at the... Um, at uh, at the space station, you see all these cables that snake through all of these tunnels and everything, and they're going through hatches. 
And you've got to cut those cables to close the hatch if you need to seal off part of the space station. So if that, you know, you're talking about worst case, yeah, uh, the International Space Station would be pretty easy to sabotage. Uh, but that, of course, would mean um, uh, basically you'd be killing people up there. So, if, you know, worst case. So let's let's talk about less than worst case. Let's just say that the Russians say, okay, we're done with you. Uh, we're going to turn off all the lights and we're going to leave. Good luck. Or I hope not good luck. You know, so that's the most likely scenario of all the real reasonable worst cases we could run into. And for that, I think we just basically say, well, don't let the, the hatch hit you in the tail as you leave. You know, so um, we would figure out a way uh, rather quickly to uh, we'd probably just seal off their part and uh, just use our part. So it'd be kind of dead weight. Uh, there, I think they have four functional modules up there right now, uh, which which for the most part, American and European and Japanese astronauts don't go into. The Russians tend to keep a little bit to themselves when they're in orbit anyway. So. It reminds me of you know, all those sitcoms in the 1970s where roommates would get pissed at each other and, you know, put a dividing line down the apartment and, you know, one, one person would have the kitchen, the other person would have the bathroom, you know, just reach a total impasse. Yeah, but, you know, um, I just don't I just don't see that. Um, for, for one thing, one of the things that when I was over there in 94 and 95, um, so we we established quite a bit of camaraderie between the two uh, programs and person to person, okay. And it was kind of interesting. On my side, um, I was I was I was let's see that in uh, ninety four ninety five I would just turn fifty. I was fifty one fifty two. I was one of the oldest, uh, if not the oldest, person on our team. The rest of them were still in their twenties and thirties, and they were just like all wide eyed about being in Moscow and so impressed by everything. <laughs> I wasn't impressed at all, I, you know. Uh, but um, I, uh, I, I'd, I'd been uh, I'd been living in the world for a, for a long time. I'd been in the war in Vietnam and all this. So I wasn't, you know. It's just like, okay, um, we have a job to do, and uh, let's do it. Now, over on the other side of the table, were the Russians on the other side of the table were older than me, quite a bit older. They were still the same men who had launched Sputnik back in the late 1950s for the most part. There were some younger ones, of course, but um, so uh, it was a matter. So they really tended to talk to me uh, in the, tra uh, the, the training people more, even though I was from Huntsville, not Houston, where all the astronauts are. I still had all this experience with the Japanese and also some with the Europeans. Uh, so uh, we established a common cause. The first thing you have to understand with the Russians when you're negotiating with them, they will never agree to anything formally. Uh, they will argue with you. They will call you names. They will, <laughs> they, will, they will just make you want to crawl across the table and choke them to death. They are so obstinate. But just then like Facebook at, today. Well, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, it's like Twitter feud, right? You know, just, you're never going to, you're never going, you're never going to convince the other side. But at the party after and with the Russians, I also might, uh, might add with the Japanese, there's always a party afterwards. And that's where the business gets done. That's where you start talking about your family and your kids and your dogs and your cats. And, and I started talking about growing up in cold West Virginia and building rockets because I'd seen Sputnik fly over. They love that. You know, so I was like in with them after after that. Meanwhile, while we serious folks were down there in the trenches trying to batter out a, an MOU, um, we had our astronauts and their cosmonauts starting to socialize and uh, talk to each other. And that was that was okay, except um, really we just came from, from two opposite camps. The astronauts essentially within NASA are sort of like little little mini gods, little demigods, okay? And so and you're sitting in there and you've got uh, some meeting and around the table, 
are engineers and scientists and managers who have managed these huge billion dollar programs and made everything happen using you know what whatever their their wonderful technical and professional experience and you have this astronaut walk in who's never flown he's maybe maybe got a sign six months ago or maybe a year ago we gave him that he sits down at the table and all of a sudden everybody just stops and listens to what he has to say okay and you don't dare say well you know you're full of prunes bob you don't know what you're talking about <laughs> because they've got so much power okay that's right you, you learn to deal with that right. over on the cosmonaut side on the russian side those guys they're like they're like Marine Corps candidates at Paris Island. They basically, if they if they speak up and say anything negative that somebody doesn't like, some manager, they know they're going to be out in their ear. They're going to get kicked out. Um, they're treated really rough. And so they're just absolutely dependent on whatever the managers want the, and the engineers want them to do. They are hired hands. And so now we're getting these two groups together <laughs> and it's like okay so how's this going to work out because the russians are not used to treating their crew members very nicely really even when they're in orbit they tell them what to do you know and uh, no wonder they carry vodka with them when they go <laughs> so um and they tell them sometimes to do very dangerous things and uh so um so it was interesting to watch the astronauts and the cosmonauts come together. It was I was just wondering how all that would ultimately evolve. Uh, it didn't change much the way that um, that we treated the astronauts. Of course, it wouldn't the way we treated the astronauts. But I think the cosmonauts um, they learned how much power that they had. So um, over the years, they've become a little bit more influential within the Russian Space Agency than they were before the International Space Station. So it's all just been a very interesting amalgam of two very, very different programs um, that I frankly hate to lose, uh, but considering um, the the irrationality that the, that the Russian government is showing right now, um, it's, um, uh, it seems to be one that, um, seems to be headed that way, that we are going to go our separate ways and, uh, and we'll do okay. Okay. But I don't know about the Russians. Um, uh, I, I don't think that they, they'll have much of a space program left because they've got nowhere to go. And finally, you know, since the in Russian invasion of Ukraine, there's been a lot of spattering, particularly from Dmitry Rogozin, head of Roscosmos. But what do you think is the is the actual most likely things that might happen over the next few years or even the well, again, months? you know, the, the 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 Russian government is acting so irrationally right now that I, I i don't i can't necessarily give you what i think rational people would do um rationally if there is still any any rationality left in that government and if uh Rikosin is actually just parroting a line and doesn't really mean it and maybe doesn't have as, as much power as he as he says rationally there won't be any change with the international space station because rationally the russians have nowhere else to go um the chinese are not going to let them on board their space station the first place the inclination of the chinese station is too high for uh, or too low that is for the russians to get up there they'd have to launch uh, <laughs> they'd have to get on a chinese rocket to get uh, a russian cosmonaut up there uh which i don't know but uh, their egos could stand that um so uh rationally they will uh, stay aboard the space station whether we like it or not and um but right now they've they've uh, canceled all of their commercial contracts and demanding that um, if there are any new ones you have to pay in rubles and uh and nobody wants to fly with them right now so essentially they are just cutting their nose off to spite their face so 
Um, but if I had to guess, you know, again, surely there are some rational people left over there and they will stay on the space station and um, and keep carrying cosmonauts up. And uh, that's about it. I don't know anybody else is going to fly with them. I just, we're supposed to fly a couple of, of our astronauts in the next year, I, but I bet those are going to be canceled. There's just no reason to, to put up with that. And uh, we'll just have to see how it goes. Well, thanks, Homer. It was great having you on the show again. Well, my pleasure, James. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and that was Homer Hickam, author of Rocket Boys and Don't Blow Yourself Up. Go get yourself a copy. They're both fabulous books. Over the last two decades, research conducted aboard the ISS delved into questions in astronomy, medicine, and biology, furthering the human drive to explore space. Even prior to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, NASA and other participants in the program were considering what to do as the space station reaches the end of its operational life which would come naturally around the year 2030. However, if Russia ends their missions to boost the station, the ISS could plummet to its demise sooner than expected. <coughs> On the 24th of February, Roscosmos director Dmitry Rogozin tweeted out an admonition to the United States pointing out that an uncontrolled re-entry of the ISS could land on the United States Europe, India, or China, but not Russia, asking how the West would keep it aloft. The orbit of the ISS does not pass over most Russian territory. Now, space developer Elon Musk responded, answering Rogozin's question with a tweet of the SpaceX logo. NASA entered the fray, pointing out that no changes are planned for operations aboard the space station. Without orbital boosts, the ISS will fall to Earth. No! If this re-entry is uncontrolled, debris could potentially hit populated areas. The haphazard re-entry of Skylab resulted in, the de in debris scattered over large areas of Australia, including a massive oxygen tank which survived re-entry. The town of Esperance in Australia population 10,000 people at the center of the debris field find NASA 400 bucks for littering. Currently, NASA plans to deorbit the space station in 2031, uh, uh, directing debris to fall into the Indian Ocean. No! Given the massive size of the International Space Station, large pieces of the vehicle are likely to survive the inferno of re-entry crashing into the ocean. Now, with any kind of luck, the fish won't find NASA, NASA for later. Over the coming weeks and months, we could see some significant changes to the operations of the, of the International Space Station and learn more about the future of this first international outpost for humanity in space. Join us on the Cosmic Companion starting on the 12th of April when we discuss intelligence, Earth and beyond. We will talk with David Leach Varga. His new book, Octopus Seahorse Jellyfish, from National Geographic just hit the shelves. We will talk about intelligence from the Earth's oceans to the depths of the universe. Join us at the Cosmic Companion anywhere online. Bring fish, or don't, whatever, it's up to you. Join us anytime at the cosmiccompanion.tv or find us on social media anywhere. Clear skies.